So, uh, the next thing I learned was that it isn't about how serious you are, basically. If you're a, a weightlifter or uh, Olympics gymnastics person from the former Soviet Union or something, then it's about how serious you are. But in these games that we play, like paragliding, like surfing or kite surfing or whatever, it's much more important to have passion and to have fun. I remember a couple of years ago there was Winter Olympics somewhere and there was a Canadian-Danish uh, snowboarder who was winning all the, those parallel slalom races in, on, on snowboard. And he continuously and repeatedly checked positive for cannabis because he was smoking a lot of dope like snowboarders do. And, uh, and everybody was saying, but how can you be a pro sports person and smoke cannabis and it's not good for you and blah, blah, blah. And that's obviously, to me anyway, bullshit. I don't smoke cannabis. It's not important to me. But if it were, then I wouldn't stop smoking just because I was wanting to do well in a competition because then I wouldn't be true to myself and I wouldn't be having so much fun. And what happens is I've often seen the people who are the most successful in the bar and who stay in the bar until 6 o'clock in the morning, as long as they're having fun and still have the passion for flying the next day, then they can fly as well as everybody the next day. So it's not really about being serious and being deprived of things and, and, and think, counting calories and doing sit-ups and push-ups and that sort of, sort of thing. It's about passion and about having fun. Um, I'm not personally very much into this bar thing at all, but uh, a couple of years ago I was in, in Salt Lake City in Utah and uh, I flew from Copenhagen to Chicago to Salt Lake City. It's a long trip. It's a 10 hour uh, time difference and half, half the globe and you get very tired. And I arrived in Salt Lake City late at night and then uh, the room that I was meant to have had been taken by some girls because they had smiled prettier than me or something like that. And uh, I was put in a tent in the garden. <laughs> and uh, the tent blew over in the wind at night because it didn't have any tent poles in it because they didn't fit and I'd found some other ones in, in, in the garage. And any, so the tent blew over in the night. And the next morning we had the first briefing and then the first task. And uh, I was second in that task. And then I went back to my tent and it blew over again the next night and I was lying there fighting my way out of the tent and, and by the time this competition was over I hadn't had a good night's sleep in eight nights or, or, or nine nights. I hadn't actually slept anything that felt like sleeping at all. Um, and and I, I, I was jet lagged because I was ten hours out of my normal time zone and I couldn't have spelled my own name if you, you'd asked me. I was walking around like a zombie, completely out of it, but I won the competition after seven tasks by six or seven hundred points, like a ridiculously large amount of points. And, and that just proves to me that it isn't really about deprivation and, and, and trying to be disciplined about uh, a particular regime of eating well and sleeping well and training well and all of that. It's about having fun and it's about passion and believing that it can happen. And I think that's an important lesson because uh, it would be very, very easy to show up on launch there and go, oh man, this is never going to work because I'm so tired. And that would have been both very easy and very true but it wouldn't be very productive. It would have worked in the exact, exact opposite way of what we wanted to accomplish. It would have pulled me down instead of lifting me up. So instead I just tried to arrive on launch and thinking, yeah, how hard can it be? It's just paragliding you've been doing for 20 years. And then force my eyes open when they say window is open and get out there. And as soon as you're out there, there's some adrenaline and there's some uh, quite a lot of excitement and you can stay awake and then uh, uh, when I land, I can collapse when I land, and that's all right, because it doesn't matter anymore. And it worked really well. And, and that was a super important lesson for me in just not letting anything get in the way of thinking positive. And uh, 
you all really need to remember that. Personally, I hope that my my survival instincts are still in place, so that it's not that I'm uh, uh, disregarding danger. It's just that I'm disregarding rational thought because my brain is too tired tired for rational thought. That's what I hope anyway. And it doesn't feel particularly unsafe either. It, it feels all right as soon as I'm in the air. It, it may feel a bit wobbly on launch, but but, it, but it's, it, as soon as I'm flying, it's, it's quite good. I remember, everybody in here probably remembers when Peter had that crash in Turkey in, in uh, 97. And uh, then he was out of the game for something like eight months, all of the winter all of that season and, and over the winter and then uh, we met in Australia next and uh, he hadn't flown since the crash and he couldn't even really walk and we had to carry his bag and we more or less had to lob him off launch for the first task in, in Australia there and he won the task, he hadn't flown for eight months and, and uh, that's, that was an important lesson as well most of us have this idea that we get rusty I hate that expression, because as soon as we tell ourselves that we're rusty, then the brain is going to think, ah, oh, we're rusty, ah. So it's not going to work optimally anymore. Instead, we just assume, it's a little bit like bicycling, isn't it? We don't forget bicycling. It's fine, we can do this. And then as soon as we start thinking in that way, then we can do it. And then it doesn't matter that we haven't flown for half a year. I don't like that expression, rusty. I think that most accidents happen to people who think they're rusty. And if that's the case, if I'm right there, then it's super important that we stop thinking of ourselves as potentially rusty. Because then we're actually thinking ourselves into the accident. I think it's quite easy. I think accidents, this is a little bit of, of pocket philosophy, but I think accidents happen to people who visualize accidents too much. If you, if you have a tendency to sit up there and look down at the terrain and look at those rocks and think, ooh, those rocks look hard. And, and how would I look if I was splattered all over those rocks? Then, then you increase your risk of actually uh, being splattered all, the, all over those rocks. And uh, I think I'm right here. And if I'm right, then it's super important for all of you to stop thinking like that. As soon as these thoughts come into your mind, hey, I'm rusty, and those rocks look really hard, and this air is really turbulent, and next thing, I'm going to have a big collapse, and then I'm going to have a spiral that we can't control, and then I'm going to hit those rocks. If you have that kind of thoughts, stop Stop having those kind of thoughts. Just file them away, think about how lovely it is to finally be out flying again because you haven't been flying enough lately and you wish you'd been flying much more and it's so good to be out in the air again and think about how great it's going to be when you get over there on that, on that sun-drenched uh, ridge where the thermals are going to take you back up to 3,200 meters and then you're going to be under that cloud and then you're going to glide over there. Think in those lanes instead of thinking in those uh, very dangerous lanes, basically. And that's what I, I consider it dangerous, basically, to be thinking rusty, uh, long time since last flight, uh, I should have done an SIV on this wing because I've never actually, and blah, blah, blah. There's so many things that most of us and most paragliders spend an awful lot of mind energy thinking that is actually much better not spent. This is important. Write it down, please. <clears throat> and uh, so the 
same thing happens when people buy a new wing or a new harness. They go, oh, but I haven't actually flown so much with this new wing. And I wonder if, if I can feel it. And I wonder if it does the same as I'm used to. And blah, blah, blah. It is just blah, blah, blah. And it's all just excuses for doing shit, basically. It's, it's something that we rehearse in our minds before standing in the, in the landing and explaining to the people coming after us why we are already there. That's what it is, basically. It's these little speeches that we rehearse on, uh, in advance so we have them ready to explain why we flew like, uh, like uh, bricks today. And, and it's not worth it because it doesn't help anyone and your mates don't care why you flew like a brick anyway. It's not important to them. It's only important to yourself and you do it much better if you don't think like that. Um, as uh, I used to be a sponsored pilot uh, for many years before I started flying UP and uh, one season in particular with Edel after Jin left to form his own brand, we had a new designer and he hadn't quite worked out how to make these competition wings yet, so every single competition I went to for a whole season, I would have a new wing, a new prototype, nobody had flown it before, nobody knew if it would even launch, and I got it in a plastic bag on launch for the first task for every competition, looking at it, yeah, that'll do, and, and, and it worked every time. Some of them were better than others, obviously, because that's how research and development is. But uh, none of them beat me, and, and none of them were unpleasant to fly, because I, I trusted that, yeah, it'll work, it'll be fine. And it, 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 uh, it meant that now, nowadays, you can give me, give me any wing you want. As long as, as, as it flies, I will fly it, and I'll fly it well, basically. I, 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 don't, I don't care what's above my head. And uh, in Australia this uh, January, <laughs> what they gave me was an EMB wing. And uh, I don't particularly enjoy flying a competition on an EMB wing because I want to win. That's what I do. But, uh, and I thought this EMB wing was probably not going to, to let me win. But I think the main reason why I didn't win the competition was that I thought I wasn't going to win it on an EMB wing, because the wing was fine. I could probably have won the, the competition on that wing if I had had more faith in it and, and been better at thinking positive in that particular instance. And then, of course, in, in Greece last week, uh, you, you know the old saying, uh, breakfast in Copenhagen, lunch in London, and dinner in New York, and your paraglider in, in Rio de Janeiro. That was exactly what happened, it's, it, except the paraglider was in, in, um, in Copenhagen and I was in Greece. So uh, frantically everybody tried to pull down, pull, pull together some equipment for me, a helmet from there, a barrier from there, some gloves from there, and, and a harness from there. And then I actually got to fly a wing that was identical to my own wing, so that was at least quite positive. But I had a completely new harness that I'd never seen before, I'd never flown before, and it worked fine. No problem, it's just a harness. Same thing, you pull on one side, then it turns to the left side. It's all there is to it. <laughs> and that's the important lesson. I think we should make a little break. I've been talking for, a, for an hour already. We, we start again in, in 10.